Chapter 4 Don't worry, Katie called out as she scrambled to pick up items from the broken box. It was just cutlery. After losing her job at the daycare center, Katie had gone back to buy the banana bread from the milk box for Cade, where she learned that the Hawkins were moving. The bank had taken the farm as well, and the family was expected to vacate by noon. A number of people were expected to go out to the farm and help the family change residences. Mabel Talbot had offered Ma Benson's old place rent-free for three months to help the Hawkins get back on their feet. Katie decided to help out. She had nothing better going on this morning now that she was unemployed, and it was the neighborly thing to do. Katie, you cut yourself. Sarah grabbed a clean rag and pressed it on Katie's thumb. Oh, Katie had a look at the cut sheepishly. That's not too bad. You should have seen what I did a couple months ago with a butter knife at the Watson's picnic. Still, it should be bandaged. Sarah grabbed her crutches, and the two went in search of the first aid kit, which thankfully hadn't been packed yet. Sarah had come home for the factory closing. The gossip around town was that she had been in a plane crash with billionaire Jake Ramsley. Someone said it was all in the tabloids, but Katie hadn't seen it. Their small town barely circulated a monthly paper. To get a city paper, one had to subscribe online or go for a long drive to make the purchase. I'm sorry about the factory, Katie commented as Sarah wrapped her thumb in gauze. It's a blow to Pendle, even if we all knew it was coming. Sarah nodded sadly. She didn't much feel like talking about the losses the town was sustaining. What about you? Anything new and exciting? Katie shrugged and gave a lopsided smile. The daycare let me go today. Oh, Katie. Sarah looked at her in sympathy and feeling a little guilt. This would be a direct result of the factory closing. Do you have another job lined up? I was offered something. I'm not sure if it will pay my bills yet, but it's a start. Katie's eyes followed a couple of the guys as they hefted an old dresser out the door. Jackson was chatting to Brant as they paused to reposition their hands to avoid wrapping their knuckles on the door frame. Both men lifted the dresser with ease. Sarah lowered her voice and leaned toward Katie as she put tape over the gauze. Still pining for Jackson? Katie jumped. Jostling the scissors Sarah was holding, causing Sarah to juggle them a moment before getting a firm grasp. Katie blushed guiltily. The two of them had exchanged confidences long ago on who their crushes were, before both had gone to college. Katie was surprised Sarah had remembered. No, not at all. Don't worry, Sarah smiled, relieved neither of them had cut themselves on the scissors. Really, Katie did have the worst luck. Your secret is safe with me. If I could just stop mooning over him, it wouldn't need to be a secret. Katie sighed, then forced a smile. She decided to turn the tables on Sarah. What about you? Did you meet someone special in the city? Not at all, Sarah said dismissively. We should get back to work before the rest of the town smells us gossiping. Katie pretended to shudder and agreed. Then they'll demand to know what we're talking about. Sharing a grin, they went back to their assigned chores. Katie continued to bring boxes out to be stashed into various vehicles, making sure any boxes she took had nothing fragile in them. Katie didn't want to accidentally break Mrs. Hawkins' good china. She grabbed a basket of clean laundry, heading outside. Katie, I heard you were let go today, Jane Morgan said with sympathy. I'm so sorry. If you need anything, please let me know. Thank you, Jane. I'm sure I'll be fine. Katie bluffed as she turned to face her friend. I'll find another job somewhere. Katie's feet kept moving, even as she turned to talk to Jane. One moment, she was walking across the wooden boards on the porch. The next, her foot hit air at the steps, and Katie stumbled backwards, the laundry basket flying upward as her hand scrambled to find something to hold onto to prevent her from falling. Laundry rained from the sky as Katie grasped air and fell into the arms and body of someone very male. Oops, Katie breathed as she pulled a towel off her face. She knew immediately it was Jackson that had broken her fall. Her face was already engulfed in a hot blush, and her stomach was doing somersaults from his nearness. You all right? Jackson drawled as he gently helped her to get to her balance, conscious of the fact that she might be pregnant. 
Jackson hoped that carrying so many things around wouldn't be an issue for Katie. So far, it seemed like she had just been taking boxes. But Jackson knew sometimes boxes could be quite heavy. Are you sure you should be carrying so many boxes? Maybe cleaning would be easier for you. I'm fine. Never better. I can handle a few boxes, Katie chirped desperately in humiliation. Why did she always have to be so clumsy? And why did Jackson always seem to be around to witness her embarrassment? Now everyone thought she was incapable of carrying some boxes without creating a disaster. I will just gather the laundry. A few people snickered as Jackson pulled an underwear off his shoulder and held it out to Katie, who guiltily snatched it back, holding it against her in a ball so hopefully no one else would see it. That might be a bit difficult for you, Katie. Rod Temple grabbed a couple of socks and a towel from the front flower beds. It looks like most of it ended up on the porch roof. We'll need a ladder. Katie looked up, and sure enough, the basket and half the contents were up on the porch roof. Her shoulders slumped. It will be fine, Jackson commented from behind her. There's a ladder in the shed. I'll get it and we'll have the laundry back in the basket in no time. Hey, Katie, if you play ball this year, you're not on my team. Dave Rembrandt laughed heartily at his own joke. Someone shushed Dave, causing Katie's face to redden even further. Jane came down the steps and grabbed Katie's arm. Why don't we go in and start the coffee and tea? It's just about time to get all the crockpots laid out so everyone can have something to eat, Jane said kindly. Katie nodded, thankful to her friend. They entered the house, which was nearly empty except for a couple of items, the crockpots and women cleaning ferociously. It was a point of pride to leave a clean home for the next owner. Katie knew that the first thing to happen once they reached Ma Benson's place would be another thorough cleaning before the family's possessions were moved in. Jane and Katie set the numerous coffee pots on to percolate. Then they set up a couple folding tables that someone had the foresight to bring. The impromptu picnic would be out on the lawn so no dirty footprints could be tracked over the floors of the farmhouse. Setting a tablecloth on one of the tables, Katie pretended not to watch Jackson climb up the ladder to the porch roof, handing down the laundry basket to Rod and tossing items of clothing into it. Jane set down a crockpot onto the table. Is that the way the wind blows? Katie tried not to turn red again and wasn't entirely successful. No, I just feel bad about all that clean laundry ending up all over the place. Now Mrs. Hawkins will have to wash it all again. Plus, she will know her undergarments were seen. It could have been worse, Jane commented. There could have been a stiff wind, and all those undergarments would be traveling all over the yard with a bunch of men chasing them. Oh, dear. Katie bit her lip as she tried not to laugh at the image Jane's words conjured in her mind. Jane grinned. See? Life can always be worse. I'm always thankful that it's only as difficult as it is. Katie rolled her eyes with a smile, and the pair continued to set up for the luncheon. Rod caught the last of the laundry as Jackson tossed it down from the roof. He waited as Jackson made his way down the ladder. I thought we should take the woodworking tools to the Benson place, quietly said Rod. As much as I want to auction them off, I know they'll hold a lot of sentimental value for the family. Likely a good idea, agreed Jackson. With everything happening in a rush, those tools might get overlooked. Jackson and Brant had enjoyed woodworking with the antiques and newer ones, trying their hand at making fancy pieces of woodworking over the years. Jackson picked up the ladder and returned it to the shed. Soon everything was packed up, ready to be transported to the new property. The group gathered around the tables, enjoying a meal and beverages. Katie wandered under an old oak tree, looking at the house wistfully. It was a beautiful place, despite the age of the building and the need for some minor cosmetic repairs which hadn't been taken care of. She wondered if she would ever have a nice home of her own in the country, or if she was doomed to find her way in a larger town or city. Katie knew that wouldn't suit her at all, but she needed an income. Doing okay? Jackson had come to stand beside her, a cup of coffee in his hand. I'm fine, Katie smiled brightly trying to ignore the butterflies that had suddenly swarmed in her stomach at the nearness of Jackson. It's all forgotten, and everyone's having a good time. As good as can be had under the circumstances, nodded Jackson. He cleared his throat. 
I had an email from Andrea. She's lined up the first book signing for Thursday. We should fly out on Wednesday if we want to make it on time. So soon? Katie asked, frowning. It was one thing to think that she had agreed to be the face of J.D. Emerson at some point in the future, yet now to have a date firmly set. Katie felt a nervousness take hold of her. I can pick you up on the way to the airport, offered Jackson. People would see if he did and think all sorts of things if they left together for weeks on end. It's probably better if I just drive myself. Katie felt a twinge of worry over the state of her car. Fingers crossed, it would make it to the airport. She would have to think of an excuse as to why she was going to be away for so long. Maybe she could just tell everyone she was visiting her parents. Someone told me you lost your job. Jackson took a sip of coffee as he looked over the crowd. I'm sorry to hear that. Katie shrugged, then realized that Jackson wouldn't see it since he wasn't looking at her. It was going to happen eventually. Things are tight for a lot of folks right now, noted Jackson, wondering how he was going to delicately broach the subject of money. Yes, they are, Katie agreed readily. She gave him a curious look. Jackson, is there something that you want to say? There is. Jackson sighed, then decided to get it over with. For someone who was at ease with putting words on paper, they didn't always come to mind in real life. I'm not sure how the daycare left you situated, but I was thinking that you might want a bit of an advance from me until the royalty checks start coming in during the tour. Katie blinked. She hadn't expected him to offer her money, even if it was just an advance. Thank you, but I'm sure I'll be fine. I was given a severance package. Oh, Jackson nodded. That's good. It was awkward, Katie decided. While it was nice of Jackson to be worried about her welfare, she didn't need anyone to rescue her. Katie felt that she had been doing fine on her own. Her bills were paid, she had a car, she managed okay. I see Jane starting to clean up. I better go help her. Jackson frowned as he watched Katie leave. She seemed a little upset, and he wasn't sure why. After all, he was going to be paying her to be the face of J.D. Emerson, so what did it matter if he offered to pay her a little early? Brant came to stand beside him. Are you sure you want to go there? Katie's pretty and a good person, but you have to admit, she's a walking disaster. Surprised, Jackson studied Brent. We're just friends. The two of you are raising a few eyebrows today. You better be careful or there'll be talk of a spring wedding. Brant sipped his own coffee. You know how this town is. The gossip's enjoying pairing people up. She lost her job today and I wanted to make sure she was okay, Jackson grunted. She's Trent's friend. I thought she was seeing it someone anyways. Brant shrugged. Not that I'm aware of. Then again, I try not to listen to the local gossip. That was a shame. Jackson hadn't heard of Katie dating anyone, nor had he noticed anyone paying particular attention to her today. Maybe her fellow wasn't here in Pendle. Maybe she had broken up with the man, or hadn't been in a relationship at all. That would make things harder to make sure the guy did right by her and his child. Jackson wasn't sure when he had decided to interfere and make sure Katie's beau looked after her and the baby, but he reasoned he had always been a bit like a big brother to her since she and Trent were best friends. Someone had to look out for Katie. I'm going to miss this place, Brant said quietly. Jackson pulled himself from his musings to pay attention to his friend. It's hard when you've lived somewhere your whole life. It will be a change moving to the Benson's farm. I don't mean the Benson's farm. I mean Pendle, clarified Brant. Been searching for a job and sending out resumes. I have an interview on the other side of the country in a week if I want it. That's a big change, commented Jackson. Brant was one of his best friends. They had grown up together, and he couldn't imagine life without him. We'll need a new pitcher on the softball team. Brant nodded. He knew that was Jackson's way of saying he would miss him. It's going to be hard not to be part of the Pendle crop dusters. I heard a couple other team members talking about leaving. Going to be hard to put a team together next year, Jackson remarked. Going to be hard on the volunteer fire department, too. Brant sighed and took another sip of coffee. Both he and Jackson were members. I expect the town will be disbanded eventually. When that happens, will there even be a volunteer fire department? 
It might have to be funded privately, shrugged Jackson. We both know it's expensive. I feel like I let the entire town down, confessed Brant, taking a deep breath. Jackson gave his friend a sharp look. They already had this conversation, and he didn't want to repeat it. Brant needed to stop dwelling on things he couldn't fix. Don't you dare go blaming yourself. You can't hold the future of an entire town on your shoulders. It isn't possible. If Hawkins' fine furniture didn't close, then the town would continue, softly protested Brant. The Hawkins family has always been responsible for Pendle, since the town was created by my ancestors. How were you going to keep the family business open? With what money? The farm is gone, and I'm betting you don't even have enough money in the bank for a plane ticket to get that job interview that you've been offered, Jackson said gruffly. You've done enough, Brant. Your family have done everything they can. It wasn't fair to expect the Hawkins to do so much. It's time to just let it be. Easy to say, hard to do, muttered Brant. His eye caught sight of someone, and he scowled fiercely. What is she doing here? Jackson grabbed Brant's arm before he could go and confront Melody Jesnell. With the mood his friend was in, it wouldn't go well. Not that anything was going well between Brant and Melody lately. The pair were in a stubborn standoff, Melody bluffing with a fake engagement to Dixby Cooley to make Brant jealous, while Brant simply refused to make a move on Melody, despite the fact that he was in love with her. Brant, like many other men in the community, felt that a man had to be the breadwinner in the home. He hadn't been taking a salary from the family company for years, using the money for debt repayment instead. She's been there the whole time helping and trying to stay out of your way. Do yourself a favor and stay out of her path unless you want to drive an even bigger rift between the two of you. All of the fight drained out of Brant as he eyed Melody. I'm tired, Jackson. I'm just plumb exhausted over my entire life. I worked so hard just to be broke and no further ahead. Most men my age have homes, families. At the very least, they've moved out of their childhood bedroom. No offense. None taken. Come on. Jackson laid a hand on Brant's shoulder. Jackson didn't mind his own circumstances. He always wanted to farm and was happy to stay in his family home. His mom could have the master bedroom for as long as she liked, in Jackson's opinion. She ruled the house, and he ruled his section of the great outdoors. There's enough help here. Let's go fishing. I can't leave and let them do all the work, grimaced Brant. It was obvious he would rather be anywhere else at the moment, but still felt obligated to help in the move. Sure you can. You've only got a few days before that job interview, if that's where you're going, Jackson said easily. Once they each had a pole in their hands, Jackson would pry gently, until he made Brant feel better about things. You need to get in as much time at the pond as possible. Let's go and see if the fish are biting. Brant hesitated, then shrugged. Why not? That's the spirit. Jackson kept his hand on Brent's shoulder as he steered his friend to his truck. On the way, he gave Owen Hawkins a nod, and Owen nodded back, realizing that his son probably needed a little time alone, and that Jackson would take care of him. That's what good friends do, Jackson reflected. I hope you're enjoying listening to Kissing Katie. If you'd like, you can find my ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks on Amazon. Happy listening.